Hello, Dr. Tromlin. You are a professor in the Department of Human Biology at Maastricht University and the lead author on the paper, The Anabolic Response to Protein Ingestion During Recovery from Exercise Has No Upper Limit in Magnitude and Duration in Vivo in Humans. So welcome to Modern Health Span, and thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks for having me. So, Dr. Tromlin, could you introduce yourself and kind of the work you do at Maastricht University, uh, please? Yeah, so our uh, group is called M3 Research, Muscle Metabolism Maastricht. Uh, so that gives a little bit of an indication uh, mm-hmm. what our interest is. Uh, and then it's muscle uh, in very different settings. It can all the way uh, from athletes trying to get bigger muscles or more conditioned muscles to, uh, I would say, the other extreme where people are fighting for their life and the intensive care. Uh, and anything in between, whether it's right. older adults uh, suffering from sarcopenia, so age-related muscle loss, people who break a leg, have uh, their leg in a cast and lose a lot of muscle mass in like a two-week period because they cannot use their muscle. Uh, so in general, we're just interested what regulates how much muscle uh, individuals have, mm. Um when does that become problematic and how does the protein we consume impact that and or other variables such as exercise, other nutrients, uh, et cetera. So that, that is a little bit of our, our main research interest, protein metabolism with a focus on, on uh, muscle tissue. Excellent. Thank you. Yeah, because yes, as you kind of alluded to, as we get older, we face the risk of becoming frail and losing muscle and just thinking about how to retain that or how to build it even as you get older is is kind of one of my my main things that I think about so you you did this paper and it was uh kind of a I mean it changed the way the view my understanding was the previous view was that you know you could use utilize 20 to 25 grams of protein per um per meal and then after that it would it would not be utilized efficiently in terms of muscle building so could you talk a little bit about the background about why you did the paper you're entirely correct that the the main view was that about 20 grams of protein at least for healthy young, young adults that's all you can use in a single meal um, for uh, muscle protein synthesis so building amino acids into muscle tissue. And then if you consume more, the belief was that it gets oxidized. So it's burned as a fuel, which is essentially a waste from a protein perspective. Now, I was skeptical of that because it didn't seem to align with uh, the longer term studies. Um, Because that concept that you can only use maybe 20 grams of protein in a meal, uh, based on that, there was this idea that you need to spread out your protein intake in various meals throughout the day. Because if you take a lot in one meal, you'll burn most of it. So you waste most of the protein you consume. So it's better to spread that protein out in different 20 gram meals throughout the day to have the highest efficiency. But when you look at longer term studies who simply looked at, for example, the impact of protein distribution on muscle mass, most studies didn't really seem to find a clear benefit of protein distribution on muscle mass. And for a long time, I thought that's a statistical issue. It's difficult to do large studies with a lot of subjects asking them to eat in a weird way for a long time. Uh, Probably at some point we get more and more data and then the picture becomes clear, but it kind of went the other way. Um, Intermittent fasting slash time restricted feeding started becoming popular. And from a protein distribution point of view, that's like the worst thing you can do. You try to eat everything in a small time window as possible. But even in those studies, you didn't really see that it was detrimental for uh, muscle mass. So it really went against that protein distribution concept based on those acute studies that measure muscle protein synthesis and oxidation. So it's like, okay, we're missing something here. And I started thinking what could potentially be wrong with those acute studies and what all these acute studies have done, including the ones in our lab, uh, 
Uh, they typically measure the metabolic response in four to maybe six hours after a meal, which is not that illogical because if you have breakfast four to six hours later, it's lunch. If you have lunch, it's four to six hours later, it's uh, dinner. So I, I guess it came from there. But um, is that always the case in real life? Well, for example, not with intermittent fasting. So I got a little bit of inspiration from uh, the snake world, where you see that a snake can eat meal of up to 25% of his body mass, which I'm an 80 kilogram meal. So that would be a 20 kilogram meal. Uh, mm -hmm. I like steak, for example. I'm not going to get to 20 grams or close to that. But with those snakes, you can see that they digest that meal for over a week and protein synthesis is elevated for longer than a week. So it is at least somewhere in biology, you have species where if you give a big meal, it just takes them very long to digest it and then utilize it for their body. So I started thinking, could the same thing apply to humans? Maybe in those acute studies, we simply haven't given the large doses of protein enough time to fully digest and be absorbed. And I kind of thought, yes, because just from personal experience, I once woke up in the middle of the night, it was like three o'clock, just had to pee. And I kind of felt that I still had food in my system. And I was like, that's weird. I had like a barbecue like nine hours ago, but it was like a barbecue where I ate a lot of meat. And I was like, hmm. I just feel I'm still digesting this food. So clearly, if we give a lot of protein in these acute studies, we should measure for a long time to give the protein the chance to actually reach the muscle. If it's still all in your gut, by definition, it's not digested, it's not absorbed, it has not reached your muscle tissue. So that's kind of the background where I thought, I believe the previous research that if you give a large amount of protein, uh, it's not ending up in your muscle in the first four to six hours later, but let's see what happens if we measure much longer. Uh, and that was the main difference in this study. I just measured over a much longer period. And uh, well, the main result was indeed when you give a very large dose of protein, um, it just needs a very long time to be digested and absorbed. And when you do it, then you clearly see yes, almost all the protein you eat ultimately can be used for protein synthesis, either in your muscle or other tissues. Are you stressed, having difficulty sleeping or commonly getting cramps? You might be missing out on a key mineral. Did you know many Americans are low in magnesium? This powerhouse mineral helps your body in over 300 ways, including calming your nerves, relaxing your muscles and helping you sleep better. Here are a few of the common signs of magnesium deficiency feeling on edge or easily annoyed, tossing and turning all night, getting muscle twitches or cramps, your blood pressure is a little high, but not all magnesium supplements are created equal. That's why I'm taking Magnesium Breakthrough from Bioptimizers. It's the only full spectrum magnesium with the seven different forms that your body can benefit from. Are you ready to feel calmer, sleep better and ditch those cramps? Here's what to do. Head over to bioptimizers.com slash modern for a 10% discount with code modern10. For a limited time, you can get free travel size bottles of magnesium breakthrough with your purchase. And it comes with a 365 day money back guarantee. Just thinking about it as you talk, I mean, evolutionarily, it also makes sense. I mean, you can't see that, uh, like, uh, I don't know, hunter gatherers go around like eating protein every four hours. So the, the protein you used was uh, cow protein, which is 80% casein and 20% whey. Now, casein takes longer to uh, process, to, to digest, I believe. Um, so if it was all whey, would it, do you think you'd have got a different result? Yeah, so whenever you do any study in our field, uh, you always have to consider which protein uh, do I take. And then there's some methodological issues. So, for example, we had something called intrinsically labeled protein, which just means you build a certain chemical flex into the protein that doesn't change anything. Uh, it acts entirely the same as cow's milk in 
the grocery uh, store, for example, it just allows us to do a lot more measurements. So sometimes I get that question like, ooh, this intrinsic label protein, where do I buy it? Well, the answer is you can't buy it. You have to produce it, but it doesn't matter. It, it's exactly the same as normal milk. Um, but then, so the question is, uh, the fact that we use milk, what would happen with other protein sources such as whey? Um, so I'll start with why we chose milk. Um, because it's the biggest contribution, well, dairy, I should say, as the biggest contribution to protein intake in the Western world. Um, because you know you're going to get the question, is this how people eat in, in real life? Well, no one would eat, say, 100 grams of dairy protein in a single meal. But just as a protein source, uh, we took the one that has the biggest contribution to total protein intake. So at least we could say, like, <laughs> if this one isn't representative, which one is? Um, then milk protein is also a very slowly digestible protein. It's uh, under acidic conditions, which happen in the stomach, it clots, and therefore it's slowly digestible. And um, we kind of like that for this experiment because we want to do the experiment as clean as possible, as little variables as possible. Um, so if you give whole meals, then not only the protein intake, but also the carbohydrate intake, the fiber intake, everything would be different. And then it's very difficult to say like what is causing the effects. So we just wanted to do a bit of protein powder. So we exclude all the other things, but by doing a slowly digestible protein powder, at least the amino acid release from that protein will resemble what would happen with normal meals. And they, like and with a normal meal, the protein would become available pretty slowly throughout of the day. Whey protein is often used in a lot of studies, including our own studies, because that is the most popular supplement in practice. So if you do a study in a post-workout setting, it makes a lot of sense to use the protein that people use in practice. And a fast digestible protein makes a lot of sense because you just consume it, you have a big availability of, of the amino acids, and probably two, three hours later after your workout, you would consume another meal. So mm -hmm. for every study you have to see in this context, is a fast digestible or a slow digestible protein preferable? Now, for your question, do I think the results would be different for whey protein? Uh, I would say the, the overall concept, uh, no. So the concept of this study is just if you give more protein, um, will that protein take a longer time period to digest and absorb? And yes, I think if you take 100 grams of whey protein, it will take a lot longer before it's digested and absorbed than 25 grams of whey protein. And as a result, I think the if you have a bigger dose of whey protein, muscle protein synthesis will stay elevated for much longer. Now, if you compare the 100 grams of whey protein versus the 100 grams of, for example, casein protein, the slow digestible protein. Um, in this study, uh, after 12 hours, the milk protein was still digesting. Um, with whey protein, I, I don't know the exact number, but maybe after 10 hours, it would have been completely digested and absorbed. Um, so the exact timelines might be slightly different, but that was really not the goal of the study. The study was just to see if you give more, do things take longer, the digestion and absorption and the anabolism. And I think that is just universal for every protein type. I did look up like absorption rates of casein and like beef and chicken and things. And casein is about the same uh, or, or faster than beef or chicken. So it, it seems to me that, yes, what you would what you did would mirror like real eating rather than people just chugging down buckets of whey.